Hello everybody, welcome to Bible Time Ministries. We are now expanding to the YouTube channels, uh, presenting Bible teaching straight out of the Word of God. See how the Holy Spirit uh, leads and directs. I uh, wanted to uh, welcome everybody that's been following the Bible studies on Tuesday nights and Thursday nights. Stick them, uh, which has been an awesome service. We're still going to be streaming live uh, both Tuesday night and Thursday night and Sunday morning. Uh, but I will no longer be able to record and store uh, the Bible studies and sermons on Stick'em on their server. So anyway, I think it's an act of God's grace. Uh, there's probably over 200 hours of Bible teaching located on that. Uh, Stick'em uh, forward slash uh, Big Preacher if you would like to go there. Or you can go to BigPreacherMan.com or ProclaimingLight.com. Either one will give you access to stick them but uh, nonetheless the Bible studies will be uh, streaming live on stick them and they will be also recorded and stored here on YouTube uh, praise to God for the medium uh, that he has uh, given us to get the gospel message out and uh, we all know that the Spirit of God is able to lead people to himself and uh, we're just trying to make ourselves available that that the Lord might use us for his glory hallelujah but I wanted to start off tonight with a very basic teaching uh, about uh, becoming a Christian. How to become a Christian. A true, born-again, bonafide, Christ-loving, Christ-walking Christian. Um, we're going to talk about being born again and the process of how to become a born-again Christian. Uh, I think there's a lot of... Uh, preachers and teachers including myself I've been guilty of this I'll confess it that uh, have sometimes forgotten the simplicity of Christianity and uh, not even necessarily wrong motives I never really thought about it but as I've been led by the Lord to do Bible studies for the past three years I've noticed that some of my teaching has become very simplistic and the Lord has used that in a very profound way uh, instead of getting into the theology and all that, uh, we complicate things. Christ is not complicated at all. And we're going to uh, go into uh, uh, John chapter 3, if you want to follow along. And we're going to see what Jesus says. I want to go through the scriptures and expound as the Holy Spirit uh, enables me. And I uh, invite you to follow along. And uh, certainly, if the Spirit of God is quickening you, if he is probing at you, prodding at you, and you feel convicted, uh, respond to him. He loves you. I uh, do want to start off, uh, I believe, in saturating everything with prayer. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll get right into the study. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you're so gracious to us. Your kindness and your mercy is everlasting. Father, even though when we don't even know it, in fact, while we were all lost in our sins, you sent Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, to the cross to bear our sins upon his body and to suffer and die. And that precious blood that he spilt was the only payment for sin that we committed. All that precious blood washes away our sins. We don't even understand how that happens. We just know it does. And we thank you for doing that for us and for the whole world. And Father, you raised him up from the dead to secure for us the eternal life. And Father, you have blessed uh, your word so many times. I don't, I'm very humbled that you would even consider using me. But, but Father, you've called me and anointed me to simply teach and preach the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. You have used these Bible studies and these sermons through the past uh, three years or so. And you have brought several people to the saving knowledge of Christ. And it's all to you. You get all the credit. It has nothing to do with me. So, Father, we just pray your spirit upon this uh, first message here on YouTube. Uh, we pray that your spirit would truly convict hearts, that everyone that is watching this, that everyone that listens to it, would truly feel your spirit. And they would be confronted with the most important question that could ever be asked and ever be answered and that is am I truly going to heaven and father 
take hold of our hearts. As we break forth your word, oh, you can accomplish great things through your word. You said that you were going to do it and it would not return to you void. So we have that precious promise. So we pray now your spirit would come and lead us through this study. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Very good. All right, John, chapter 3. Very exciting. It's awesome. Uh, John, chapter 3. <clears throat> I've often thought about uh, how to approach uh, this type of Bible study. Uh, I know I've done it in different ways in times past on Tuesday and Thursday. Um I normally read through the entire scripture that we're going to be talking about. I usually do uh, what is known as expository teaching. That's verse by verse, chapter by chapter, precept by precept. But uh, for this uh, Bible study, I, I don't want to do it quite that way. I will be going uh, through several different scriptures. Uh, so I'm just going to re start reading and then comment as the Lord uh, directs me. But we're going to be starting in John chapter 3, verse 1. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. First and foremost, we need to understand that a Pharisee, uh, this guy named Nicodemus, Jewish ruling council, was actually the Supreme Court of Israel. Uh, everything was passed through the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day. He came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi. So he's acknowledging that Jesus is at least a rabbi. Uh, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing unless God were not with him. In reply to this, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see this kingdom of God unless he is born again. Hmm. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, that's kind of a shocking statement, wouldn't you agree? That Jesus telling a Pharisee, a member of the Jewish ruling council, that uh, he's not going to see the kingdom of God unless he is born again? Uh... And he's also telling us the same thing. If we want to see the kingdom of God, in other words, if we want to see heaven, we must be born again. There is not a, um, a choice in the matter. Unless you are born again, you will no way or no wise see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus in verse 4 says, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. So right here, Nicodemus has taken more of a physical approach uh, to what Jesus just said instead of the more important spiritual aspect of it. Well, of course, Nicodemus is right. Of course, you can't, when you're old, you can't go back into your mother's womb to be born again physically. Of course, you cannot. But listen how Jesus answers him. Verse 5. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one, including you and me, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. And he goes in verse 6, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must, that means there is no other option here. You have to be. You must be born again. So Nicodemus has taken a physical approach about being born a second time in his mother's womb. Jesus is bringing in not only the physical but the spiritual aspect. Now I want to make this statement to you. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this. I don't know. But all of us, all of mankind is born physically alive but spiritually we're dead. Right? Because we've all been born from the flesh, from our mother's womb. We are fleshly beings. We are born physically alive. Now we can go into the reason why that is, just to make time short. Adam disobeyed God and plunged the entire human race into sin. 
Adam disobeyed God. God told him, don't eat of any tree. You can have anything you want, but don't take the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat it, you will surely die. Spiritually. So we are all born physically alive, but spiritually we are separated from a holy God because of sin. Right? Jesus is telling Nicodemus, who should have known this, by the way, uh, because he said in verse 7, you should have, you should not be surprised at my saying. Because the Spirit is what brings our spirit alive. We'll get into that deeper in just a moment. Verse 8. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it, is, where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Hmm. Nicodemus, verse 9. How can this be? Jesus said, You are Israel's teacher, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? In a nutshell, what Jesus is telling Nicodemus is you can't you can't even fathom the physical things much less the spiritual things uh, in layman's terms you can't understand God unless you are born again you can't understand spiritual things unless you are born again in the spirit have you ever wondered uh, maybe you you're seeking God you know and you're not sure about God or you're sure about you know what you've heard different people talking about well guess what God wants you to know all about him, but you must first be born again in order to understand the things of God. That's what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. And he goes in, and this is a, such a profound thing. Listen, verse 13, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man, which is Jesus. So now Jesus knows the Pharisee's heart. And he brings in Israel's past, which the Pharisee obviously knew about Moses, and Jesus teaches him concerning Moses. Verse 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. <coughs> Israelites, God's own people, his chosen people, to bring forth the Messiah, the Savior of the world, um, became uh, idol worshipers, if you will, um, and God uh, got fed up with them and wouldn't let them enter the promised land that he promised them, which is modern-day Israel. Uh, so he caused them to be wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Well, during that time of wandering, uh, there was a lot of stuff going on. They still wouldn't believe in God, even after all the miraculous uh, exodus from Egypt and, and whatnot, the parting of the Red Sea, uh, and God uh, sent them a plague of snakes. The snakes would bite them and it would kill them. Well, because God is a merciful God, he instructed Moses to lift up on a pole a serpent, a brass serpent, that if everybody that was in Israel in the desert, when the snakes came, if they would simply look at that serpent, they wouldn't die, but they would be saved. They would be spared. And Jesus is relating that to himself, saying, So the Son of Man, Jesus, also must be lifted up. Lifted up where? Lifted up on a cross. That if everyone who believes in him, trusts in him, they would have eternal life. He goes on, very simply put, one of the most uh, famous verses in the Bible is John 3.16. We know that for God so loved the world... That's the people, you and I, that he, what? That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, right, but have eternal life. And there's so many people that uh, have heard hellfire and damnation that God just wants to send you to hell and God wants to do this and God wants to do that. Well, listen to what Jesus says about it. Verse 17. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. 
Jesus doesn't want to condemn you. He doesn't. He wants to save you. That's who he is. He's the Savior. And he goes on, he says in verse 18, whoever believes in him, that means whoever trusts in him, is not condemned. But whoever does not or whoever refuses to look at him lifted up on the cross, they stand condemned already. Right? Because they do not believe in the name of God's one and only Son. Wow. That brings us to a decision point here. Are you born again? Do you understand the things of God? Do you understand anything that's being said? Um, wow. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came to save you. And this is the verdict. This is the condemnation that Jesus was referring to. In verse 19 he says, this is the verdict. Light has come, what, into the world... But men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Wow. Jesus is the light of the world. He's the only hope for mankind. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient Savior. He's the only one that did not commit sin on his li in his life, earthly ministry. He never committed a sin, became sin for us, died on the cross, rose from the dead, right? which we'll get into in just a moment, of how to be born again. But he is the light of the world. But men love darkness instead of the light because their deeds are evil. Well, is Jesus saying that people love their sins? Is that true? They won't come to the light because their deeds are evil. And in fact, he goes on in verse 20, Everyone who does evil, everyone who commits sin that is lost in their sins, hates the light and will not come to the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Wow. Have you ever lied? You ever cheated? You ever stole? You ever lusted in your heart? Well, guess what? You're a sinner. Okay? I am too. If there was one time in my life I didn't understand the Bible, I didn't understand what all this was saying. I heard different preachers talk about it. But it's a true thing because Jesus said it. It's true. It, I can t testify to the fact that I didn't want to come into the light. I didn't want all my nasties exposed. I didn't want anybody to know what I'd done. But you know what? The revelation came to me that everybody already knew, especially God. Especially God. He already knew, just like he already knows. But they refuse to come to Jesus Christ. That's the verdict. Verse 21, so very important. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what has been done has been done through God. Well, where do we go from here? I can testify to you that there has been a change in my life. I used to live live in sin. I used to, I guess you could say, as Jesus said, I didn't want to come into life because I was afraid everybody would see my sins. Uh, but there was a change in my life. The thought came, wow, you're not God, William. <laughs> You you need a savior because you're a sin, you're a wretched sinner. Ugh. So I just simply, I said, all right, I, Jesus, come and save me. I know you died on the cross, and and the Bible says you was raised from the dead. I'm just trusting in you to, that that that's exactly what happened. And you know, something miraculous happened to me. I cried out to him for mercy probably about three hours I just started confessing my sins I mean I already came, I already came to the knowledge that he already knew God is God all right he knew that I was a sinner and I was just agreeing with him <laughs> I started crying out to him I was like well I've lied this time and woof I mean I was just listening him out I was just crying out to him just me and God probably about three hours crying out God have mercy on me I'm a sinner I agree with you I am a sinner and something miraculous happened to me sometime later. There was a change in my life. There was a change. I actually was born again. 
I was actually born again. And things started happening in my life that, wow, changed from the inside out. My thinking started changing. I started seeing things differently than I'd never seen before. I would read Bible verses and it would make sense where before it never made sense. There was a change in my life. Well, let me ask you something. Has there ever been a change in your life? Has there ever been a time where you can, that is a defining moment that you knew that, wow, you really do need a Savior and Jesus did come in to save you and that there was a change in your life? It doesn't have to be a, a bright burning bush. It wasn't for me. But there was a subtle change that happened. And that change just started growing. And it's still growing, by the way. <laughs> it doesn't stop. So, and you know what? In verse 21, where, where Jesus says here, Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what has been done has been done through God. I give him all the praise, glory, and honor. I didn't save myself. Hello, you can't save yourself either. But Jesus sure can, and he did. And I'll tell you what, I don't mind telling anybody. I'll brag on Jesus Christ all day long, every day. It doesn't matter to me because I don't want anybody to give me credit for nothing. I want everybody to see that what has plainly happened to William Allen has been happened through the grace of God. Jesus is the one that changed me. Now, I want to ask you a question. How to be born again? I mean, we, we heard the teachings of John 3, uh, verses 1 through 21. We heard what Jesus and the religious leader were talking about. Uh, how do you become born again Christian? <laughs> what a concept. A very simple thing here. Well, let's turn to uh, the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter. Mark chapter 1. There's uh, two verses that I want to bring up before I explain the process of how to be born again. Mark chapter 1, verse uh, 14 and 15. Listen closely. Mark 1, verses 14 and 15. After John, that is John the Baptist, after John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is near. And listen to this very simple, profound statement, what Jesus said. Repent and believe the good news. Remember, we're trying to, def we're trying to define how to be born again. Jesus, the, so the Savior, the Son of God, said simply to repent and believe the good news. Remember, Jesus said, you must be born again. No one is going to enter the kingdom of God unless he is born again, right? Jesus says, repent and believe the good news. Well, let's look at these two words. I want to look at two words real quick. Repent and believe. Let's look at these. Very simple. The word repent in this verse is a Greek word that simply means to think differently. To think differently. Remember I said that there was a subtle change that happened to me, that I started seeing things differently, I started thinking different. That's because I cried out to God. I confessed my sins to Him. I agreed with Him that I was a sinner, right? Then I trusted in Christ. I was repenting. I thought differently, right? It literally means to think differently or afterwards, to reconsider, right? Or to feel compunction, you know, the conviction, right? It's a change that happens. There's a change when you repent. It's a change of mind. It's a change of moral. It's a change of everything. Right? Now the other word, believe. It literally means to put faith or to have trust in. Uh, and by implication, it literally means... To put yourself, your spiritual well-being, in the hands of Jesus. Literally, that's what believe is. I am believing, I am putting faith, I am trusting that Jesus is my Savior, that my spiritual well-being is now in His hands. 
that is what it means to commit yourself to trust in him that what that's what it means to believe so Jesus simply says repent and believe the good news all right the process what was the process how to be born again well the, there's two processes for you to be born again first of all you have to agree with God that you are a sinner you have to be in agreement with him that you have lied you have cheated you've stolen you've lusted in your heart after men and women you you know you've you've coveted you've de desired things that didn't belong to you right you you've committed sin so become in agreement with God this is the first process of being born again is to start thinking differently agree with God and then your moral and your compunction your convictions will change and it's it's a turning away it's a turning you're turning away from your sinfulness and you're turning in belief to Christ that's what repentance is so that's the first process you have got to repent <laughs> forget it you're not going to ever you're never enter the kingdom of God unless you repent of your sins you got to think differently about it you got to turn and trust in Christ right those are the first two processes of being born again right it's a requirement. It's a requirement. You must be born again, Jesus said. No one's going to enter King God unless they're born again. So, Jesus said, repent and believe the good news. All right. Well, what's the good news? <laughs> what's the good news? Wow. This is awesome news. What is the good news? I'm glad you asked. Here's the good news, um, and it's found in 1 Corinthians 15. If you want to go in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the Bible very plainly lays it out for us what the good news is. It's actually uh, the gospel. You've probably heard the word gospel before. Well, the word gospel literally means good news, but what is the good news? Remember, we're trying to understand how to be born again in Christ, right? we want our spirit man to become alive right because we're physically alive but we're spiritually dead we want to be born again so we gotta repent think differently right do differently than you were before and you gotta put faith or trust in the gospel well what is the gospel first corinthians fifteen ver the first five verses tell us plainly what the gospel or what the good news is here it is brothers I want to remind you of the gospel or the good news I preached to you which you received there's the receiving right on which you have taken your stand by this gospel or by this good news you are saved your salvation depends upon this gospel this is the gospel of salvation this is the process of being born again becoming alive in Christ finally once in my life I can start afresh I can start anew the old things are now gone behold the new things are coming right this is the gospel of salvation verse 2 if ah, very big it's a small word but it's got big ramifications if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you otherwise you have believed in vain in other words uh, the gospel is to be clinged on to and never let go of right we must hold firmly to it hold firmly to the gospel of salvation because this is how we are saved this is how we are born again this is the whole point of Jesus Christ coming to this earth this is it right here verse 3 Paul says, for what I received, I passed on to you as the first importance. The most important thing is that Christ Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures, right? That Jesus, as he was telling Nicodemus, that Jesus, 
The Jesus of the Bible is the sinless Son of God. He came and he died on a cross for our sins. Not his sins. He never committed sins. But he died for your sins and he died for my sins. Right? And that he was buried. And that's an important aspect because a lot of people might blow that one off. Uh, but you know what? Jesus was physically, right, God in the flesh. The Bible tells us that. That he is, right, that he is God in the flesh. And he bar he was buried. There's a lot of people that don't believe that Jesus actually bodily rose from the dead. Uh, that's a misnomer. No one survives the Roman cross. You know what? I challenge you. If you're a skeptic, you don't believe all this is hogwash, is blah, 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 that there's no way that he was raised from the dead. Go back and study your history. Study the history of the Roman cross, the crucifixion. No one survived the Roman cross. He was buried. He was graveyard dead. In fact, the gospel records that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, as the first importance, he died for our sins. There was a, well, there was an earthquake and things going on, and and uh, they were afraid that Jesus wasn't quite dead. So uh, a Roman took his spear and jabbed it into his side, and lo and behold, what happened? Water came out first, and then blood. Well, it's a scientific fact that when a person dies, immediately when they breathe their last, water and blood separate. Jesus was graveyard dead because he was buried. All right? And that he was raised, he was resurrected on the third day according to the scriptures. And that in fact, in verse 5, he did appear to Peter and then to the twelve. And then eventually he did appear to the Apostle Paul. So here's the good news. Here's the gospel. Is that Christ died for your sins. He shed his blood. He died for you and he died for me. And died for the sins of the whole world. <clears throat> Remember John 3.16. That whosoever believes in him. Right. So Christ died for our sins and the sins of everyone who would believe. That he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead the third day. And folks, the simple truth is, you must be born again. How are you born again? By simply agreeing with God, repenting, agreeing with God that you're a sinner, and that Christ did indeed die on a cross for you, and that he was buried and that he was raised from the dead. If you would simply trust that he did that, that's it. Boom, you're born again. It's by it's a change of heart. It's a change. Your spirit man then becomes alive. Because you're no longer trusting in yourself. You're no longer trusting in man. You're trusting in God. That he did indeed do it for you. And did it for me. So what's stopping you? You want to be born again? You want to start a new life? Do you do you need a new life? I mean, I'll just be quite honest and blunt. If you're miserable, you know, miserable, don't have no peace, no joy in your heart, no. If you don't, guess what? That's a result of either your sins or the sins of somebody else. It's the result of sin. So why would we cling on to something that brings misery and suffering to our lives? Misery and suffering comes as a result of sin. Right? It does. And everybody sinned. I mean, you, there's atheists out there that say, eh, I don't believe in this God thing. But you know what? Can they really deny that there is evil in the world? That the raping and maiming and murder, that that is good, that that's, that's not evil. Of course, they, they would never say that. They might still deny God. But can you really deny that there is evil in the world? I mean, wow, have you looked around lately? There's a lot of evil in the world. Well, guess what? That's sin. That's man's sin. But Jesus is man's savior. So agree with God. Lay your just confess your sins that you already know you've committed sins. 
And God certainly knows, but he loves you so much. You know how much he loves you? I'll tell you how much he loves you. He loves you enough to die on a cross for you. To take your sins away from you and pay the penalty on the cross. Put it in a different way. It's kind of the way that I kind of, you know, I say that I view it this way, but the scriptures lay it out this way. That, uh, wow, while I was still lost in my sins, Christ died for me. <laughs> when I was still lost in my sins, Christ died for me. That's how much he loves you. He was crucified for me and for you. Wow. How can we deny that? Oh, you can deny it and continue to live in sin and misery. But I would recommend highly that you just simply take, and you might need to listen to this again. You may need to go through them verses again. It's God's word. It's clear. It's simple. And quite frankly, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. It's the truth. It, does, it doesn't depend on whether we believe it's God's word or not. It is God's word. It is the truth. Jesus did come, and he did die, right? And he did rise from the dead to save us, right? you got to simply trust that, that he did it for you. You don't have to do anything. Oh, don't hand me this, all this religious stuff, you know, religions of the world. You know what religion is? Religion is man's attempt to reach a holy God. Well, guess what? Christianity, true biblical Christianity, <laughs> we we know we can't reach him. We can't be good enough. But God reaches down to us. He reaches down to us in the person of Jesus Christ. He does. And he wants to have a personal, intimate relationship with you. He does. A personal, intimate relationship with you. That's what he wants. That's what he desires. He loves you that much. Why don't you give yourself to him? Give yourself to him. Just do like I did. Or if you want something that Jesus said, you know, we all like to have a little process of how to become a Christian or how to be born again. I've discussed that, but I'll discuss it in, in a little different way. Uh, by teaching you what Jesus taught. He taught a parable, a story. He said two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, again a religious leader, and one was a tax collector, a dirty, rotten sinner. Because tax collectors of those days, <laughs> they always took a little bit for themselves, right? Okay. So you had two men going up to the temple to pray. One a religious leader and one a sinner, if you will. They go up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee's all puffed up in himself, and he prays all about himself. Well, God, I did this for you, and God, I did this, and, and woo. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah, God, <laughs> woo, I tithe, I give my tithes, and I do this for you, and I do that for you, and, and thank you, God, that I'm not like that sinner over there. That's, that's pretty much what he prayed. <laughs> Self-righteous, you know. And the little sinner over there, just like me, probably just like you. He, did, he didn't necessarily disagree with what the religious leader was saying. He knew he was a sinner. He knew he stole money. You know, he was a thief. He was a tax collector. He was a thief, you know. He didn't necessarily disagree. But he was so convicted. You know, he was so, wow, broken in his spirit. He couldn't even lift his head up. He couldn't. He couldn't lift his head up. And you know what he simply did? He beat his breast. And he cried out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said that he went home justified where the Pharisee didn't. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's it. You know what mercy is? I'll tell you what mercy is. Mercy is God does not impute your sins against you. In other words, God's mercy is God does not treat you as your sins deserve. You don't have to pay the penalty. Jesus paid it for you. That's mercy. <laughs> Thank God. You know what grace is? Grace is Jesus Christ hanging on a cross. That that's God's favor. 
that he did it for all of us. He did it for all of us. God's grace, his act of kindness, oh yes, the crucifixion of his son. That's mercy and grace. So, I'll leave it up to you. The Holy Spirit have his way with this Bible study, with this uh, ministry, this uh, YouTube. I don't know. You can send me a note. You can, you know, whatever you, whatever you're led to do. And that's okay. Uh, I can promise you this. I'll love you. I will. I've had death threats. People saying that they know where I live and they're going to come and cut me from ear to ear. Well, you can threaten me with heaven. That's okay. I know where I'm going to go when I die. I know if I breathe my last, I'll go be with Jesus because he's my Savior. You can send an email, a comment. Uh, maybe you can praise the Lord. I don't know. Whatever you're compelled to do, do it. Or as uh, one person told me not too long ago, if you're going to do it, do it. Don't wait. Right? Don't put it off. It's the most important thing you can do is to surrender your life to a God who loves you enough to die on a cross and rise himself up from the dead to save you. That's all you have to do is surrender your life to him. Thank you for coming and thank you for supporting the simple gospel of Bible Time Ministries.